Hello, and we're back with Off the Press. This is James Berger with the Bakersfield, Californian, and I'm joined here with my two co-hosts, Nicole Parra from Cal State Bakersfield Poli Sci faculty, and Russell Johnson, government affairs uh, consultant here in town. And we're joined by our uh, guest today, David, <laughs> also known as Congressman <laughs> David Valadeo from the 21st District. Uh, and welcome back, uh, everyone. And so uh, tell us a little bit about what it is to like to represent the 21st district because it's such a unique weird <laughs> e e distended bakersfield to fresno district what it's got to be a little bit weird to to, to have such a geographically diverse a lot of driving <laughs> i started yesterday morning um in fresno ended up last night leaving here probably around 8 30 in bakersfield and uh, still going home and this morning leaving again to be here um a lot of time on the road uh, so we have to do everything we can and look for different ways to represent the district. Uh, I take I take things very seriously on my office as far as far as reaching out to the communities and reaching out because I have it's not like I go to the city of Bakersfield and talk to two hundred thousand of my constituents. <laughs> I'm going to a lot of very very small communities, right. and so you do your best to get in every single one. But whenever we do something like uh, I had a community coffee down in um, Arvin not too long ago, I did one in Kingsburg two weekends ago. Uh, we'll reach out and actually call people at home. Instead of doing like a robo-dial with a recording of me, which we do those too, uh, but for the one in Arvin, we actually made 12,000 personal phone calls. And it's not, uh, you know, with the VoIP phones where it's automatically dialing. It's interns making calls, reaching out, talking to people. And we also try our best to get as much information out of these people as possible, what's important to them, uh, what do they want to see me working on, uh, what are they not happy with. But making sure we have that outreach. And then we do things like teletown halls where you call 30,000 people. Um, and then things like every single person that writes into the office, um, obviously because 700,000 people, I don't have the, person, the, response, the ability to write every single letter personally, but I do want to sign every single one personally. I like to sign them. I like to see people's names, addresses. Sometimes I'll catch mistakes. I mean, there, there's a, <laughs> but y you'll catch those mistakes, but then you'll start to see, hey, this person, you start to recognize a lot of names. So if you run into someone on the street, and they say something to you, say, oh, yeah, I have seen your letter. I have seen your name quite a bit. And, you, and I, I might not, because I'll have letters stacks two inches, three inches tall sitting on my desk, right. and I'll sit at my desk till 1, 2 in the morning signing those. But I feel like it's really important to do that um, because you feel connected. You know that a bunch of people in Arvin are writing you about this. You know a bunch of people in Lemoore are writing you about this. And it's just another one of the processes we do to try to stay in touch as much as possible and stay connected. So every time I'm making a decision back there, I know who I'm representing and every time I push that button and who it's for. So you talk about being connected to the district and you know, with the district as diverse as James described, what are the issues you're, you're pushing while you're back in DC and what are your top priorities? Um, not just this session, but just in general overall and looking forward to the election? So the two issues that, I mean, the simplest one, the simplest one, the, the <laughs> one that to get the most people unified on is water. Uh, everybody, that's the one that, uh, when we do a uh, teletown hall, I almost have to go through the calls and try to look for other calls because everybody wants to ask about water. I might have asked, answered a question, but then there was another angle that they want to ask that same type of question. So water comes up a lot. Uh, for the most part, uh, Things have gone really well. That's obviously a top priority. Immigration is actually one of the, the more interesting ones because um, even when I signed on to the immigration bill, uh, H.R. 15, uh, I got a lot of heat from people who were kids like myself or people like myself, son of immigrants or immigrants themselves who had gone through the process, and they said, hey, I don't want this kid, this person, I don't want anybody to jump in front, or they might have a relative. And so it's, a, it's one of those, one of the more complicated ones that I have to spend a lot more time on. And I've had times at my community coffees where people approach me, pull me aside, and say, hey, Dave, I disagree with you on this, and we'll have a conversation. I'll explain my point of view, and, and they'll explain theirs. And sometimes we agree, and sometimes we don't. Uh, but my goal is to, to get something done. And so immigration for me is a top priority. I, I do want to see something get done. I want to see it get done right. Um, and it's something that I think affects a lot of people in my district. What, what do you think, uh, uh, which campaign, which presidential campaign candidate do you think might help that dialogue go forward more? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for that, James. It's, I, I mean, it's, it's right. an interesting, but I mean, those... It, Although one presidential candidate has softened his position, uh, <laughs> but, but I mean that the the it's an interesting thing that yeah. and water. I mean yeah. I know you've spent a lot of time in water, but both immigration and water are critical to the the, the discussion here in the valley and in your district, which mm -hmm. is very Latino. How how do you 
see the outcome of the uh, presidential election influencing the discussion of those two issues? Well, the main thing is once it's over, all the all the rhetoric is stopped. That's the most important part. And, and when the the folks just blasting op opinions into a crowd, trying to get people riled up, and that happens on both sides, uh, is not helpful. Um, I, I think we just have to have because immigration policy is difficult enough to have in a closed door closed room with people who just want to solve the problem to figure out how you do it. How do you create uh, a law, or write a law that basically points at people and says, okay, you're one that we want in this country, you're one that we don't, without knowing a whole lot about them? And what government agency is going to be that well ran and that efficient, I mean, no government agency ever is, to implement those types of rules and regulations? Obviously, you get into securing the border and those types of issues. But the immigration process itself, especially with the 11 million that are here or even future people who want to come to this country, how do you write that law? And it's difficult enough to do without the campaign going on. And the campaign makes things a lot more difficult. So once it's over, no matter who wins, it gets, I think it gets easier. Um, now, depending on who wins, obviously there, there are some differences of opinion. Uh, one has softened. I don't know what that means yet. <laughs> so, um, so we'll see how that, that means plays how out. many electoral votes will, will I change from my position, maybe? Right. <laughs> well, one thing that's interesting, whether it's immigration or, or something else, but the fact that that many people talk about it and it's that prevalent lets you know that the system we have right now is broken and it needs to be fixed. Otherwise, uh, no matter what the solution is, it ain't working now. Otherwise, people wouldn't get so fired up about it. Sorry. Well, I've got constituents in my district who did come here the legal way through uh, guest worker visas and look to resolve their or adjust their status. And we have federal agencies who are fee-based agencies who want you to apply, once you go to the process, and then this person continue to get denied and denied over again, never giving them a straight answer. They, in my opinion, this agency stole, mm -hmm. robbed from my constituent. And uh, when I made one phone call to find out what was going on, why are you giving this guy the runaround? Oh, he didn't qualify. He made this one mistake. Uh, he forgot to check a box on the form when he first got here. And uh, so, no, he doesn't qualify. So why didn't you just say that and not, and not take his money? Mm -hmm. But they're a fee-based agency. They run on those dollars. And, and I guarantee there are a lot more stories like that out there. Because 40% of the people that are here uh, illegally today are people who came here legally. Mm -hmm. And so trying to readjust their status and trying to figure that out, I think something has to be resolved. Uh, I think we have to figure out who these people are and what they've actually done. And, and sort that out as we go. But the rhetoric out there doesn't help either side uh, because neither side is right. I, I don't think it's not possible to deport them all, and I, I don't think it's right to give everybody a slippery slope to citizenship where they become citizens on accident. Uh, I think you have to have a law, figure them out, a process to go through and figure out what their backgrounds are, how they got here, what they did while they're here, what they've contributed to society, and, uh, and then once we know that, and then start to figure out where they go forward from there. And the Democrats had the opportunity in the early 90s. They had both houses. They had a Democratic president, and they did nothing on immigration reform. So, again, it is a lot of rhetoric and trying to get votes by both parties, right. and it's really going to take people who understand the process to move this forward. And so when people say, oh, it's the Republicans, no, it's not. Remember the early 90s, the Democratic Party failed uh, regarding immigration also. And so, and uh, I, that that takes me to the, the, the thought of, like, is the – is it actually more important who ends up in the House and the Senate than it is who ends up in the White House? I think you have to have um, – I, I honestly believe the House and the Senate are more important because that's where the policy is written and, uh, and making sure that it's done right because this isn't something you get to do every day. And uh, especially as, as excited people get over this, um, you really have to make sure it's done right. And it's going to be difficult enough. I mean, I've sat through a lot of meetings about a lot of different folks – and it's simple to say, get rid of the good, uh, keep the good ones, get rid of the bad ones. <laughs> <laughs> How do you do that? So, yeah, and that's, that's difficult. And making sure that, and when we talk about putting people in prison for five years if they're violent or if they've committed a crime like what happened up in San Francisco with Kate Steinway mm -hmm. and Kate's Law, I mean, those things are things that people are really concerned with. And I even know people who are here uh, undocumented and have been uh, taken advantage by those folks, mm -hmm. those same folks. So they want them out just as bad as, as we do. Um, it just, we have to go through this process to figure who they are. And it's going to take cooler heads to prevail and have a, a, an honest debate about who these people are, what they're doing. And there's a lot of folks that are here that came here for work but actually sent a lot of money back and want to go back because they want to live there and live very well because they make more money here. 
And th once they've spent as much money as they have to come across the border, if it's coyotes or whatever, and some si one side will say, oh, it's so easy to get across the border, they just walk across. But if you talk to the folks who are actually getting across the border, what it's cost back, let's say 10 years ago when it was a couple thousand dollars to pay to get across the border, where now I hear it's upwards of eight to $12,000, obviously something's changed. Right. And, and it's not as easy to get them across. Maybe they're more high value targets, maybe it's drugs that are being run across that's taken the spot of that person, uh, right. but it, it's all about the money and right now it, it costs more. So something is more difficult to get across. So immigration, doozy of a topic, very complex. The other one you said that you have as a priority is water. I don't think there's anything as complicated uh. as water, just to understand all the nuances of it. Uh, I had the the privilege of sitting on the city of Bakersfield's water board, and th there was times you just go, whoa, your eyes glaze over, and understanding water law is very difficult. But w what do you think the solution is to water? We had your opponent here a couple weeks ago. He identified some of the things he thought were solutions. What do you think the solution is to water? So um, water policy is difficult when you get into the weeds, but the simple uh, answer is more is better. <laughs> make the pie bigger because what happens where the where we're at right now is a lot of the water agencies are fighting with each other because the pie has gotten smaller and so it's gotten much uglier and then they get very technical now because we need this water or you traded that water and if we had if we had a bigger pie life would be a lot easier for all of us but uh, in the bill that I introduced 2898 which that bill is sitting in the Senate uh, we attach it to uh, three other bills and then we've got a piece of it in a, a fourth bill um, what that bill does is it actually streamlines the process to build more reservoirs. We need more reservoirs. Uh, it changes the way we look at pumping in the, re uh, in the delta, which is very important because this year we had water going through the delta out into the ocean that was not pumped. We missed a lot of opportunities. At high flow periods when there were upwards of over 150,000 cubic feet a second water flowing through there, they actually turned pumps down to almost nothing. And the reason why they did that was that big burst of water coming in, which was the best opportunity to pump also kicked up dust, turbidity, that's where the little fish hide, and the focus is, uh, well, we can't turn these on because the fish are hiding in those clouds, the turbidity, and so we turn the pumps off and allow the water to go out into the ocean. And San Luis Reservoir, which I'll be there Friday, is at, I think, 12% of, uh, of capacity right now, so nearly empty. And uh, so the number one thing that has to be done is change the way we look at those pumps and what we operate there. And then we also have some other aspects in there, um, and there was a, a decision made today by a water agency up there to, to avoid, uh, to not do anything about, but 60 to upwards of 95% of delta smelt and salmonoid are consumed by striped bass and other bass mm -hmm. species in the delta. Uh, one of the things we offer in the bill is to lift take limits so they can, so fishermen can catch more and get rid of them. Because if you're there to save the species, do something about what's eating them. Mm -hmm especially if you're consuming, and the worst study showing only 60% of them are consumed, that's already over half. Mm -hmm. If it is 90%, like some of the studies I've seen show, that's the majority now, and that's a strong, that's pretty much all of them. So if you truly want to save the species, let's do something about it, and that's one of the solutions we offer in the bill. And then we also look at the San Joaquin River Settlement, which is the whole east side of the valley. Uh, we've got communities all the way up and down, from Arvin all the way up to McFarland, Tipton, Pixley, uh, even in Tulare and Fresno that are Friant contractors off the Friant Reservoir. We changed the San Luis, uh, or the San Joaquin um, River Settlement, and we turned that into warm water fishery, so not so much water is wasted, and the water is actually going back down along the east side of the valley and feeding those communities, uh, and that is very important. So. Um, Anybody that disagrees with that, um, I'd love to see their proposal because there is no other way. Um, the only other way to fix the water problem without sending more water is to uh, get rid of the communities and the farmers, mm -hmm. uh, the, the consumption side of water, because mm -hmm. there's no other water to get. I can hear Beatrice Espericueto at the Farm Bureau not very happy <laughs> with uh, the alternative, but, uh, you know, I mean, common sense, and it's unfortunate that Sometimes the uh, other side uh, isn't willing to answer or answer some of those questions, especially regarding this what this tiny fish that is you know devastating economies in the Central Valley. And no one will deny that pumping does right. uh, it has an impact on the delta. We all know that. No one's going to deny that. But we have to make sure there's common sense mm -hmm. science there that says, okay, if we're going to save this species, let's get to the bottom of that. Mm -hmm. And there are other things going on in the delta, so now there's a lot that has to do with salinity and keeping salt water out in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so they do use a lot of water, and they'll use certain periods of time. They'll use that water to push salt water out, and those communities in that area are pumping water out of the delta for their own personal use there, if it's farmers or even some communities. And so we are competing with them a little bit mm -hmm. too. Uh, but the level of, uh, 
of water or where they're keeping that salt lev uh, barrier now is way beyond anything that we've ever done in the past, and it's way beyond anything I think is necessary. And so I think there's some middle ground there, uh, but obviously getting some folks. Or our biggest hang-up right now is in the Senate. I mean, getting in the Senate, there was actually a hearing on July 13th. Uh, Senator Murkowski from Alaska, who's actually been to the Valley a few times, and I've spent some time here in the Valley with her, uh, actually came down and spent some time, and she had a hearing. My bill was in a hearing one day, and then in Ju on July 13th, there was actually a markup where we had an opportunity to present bills, or our senators did, and Senator Flake introduced his water bill, a couple other se senators presented theirs, but no California bill. Neither mine nor uh, our senator's bill or any sort of compromise was offered, and we actually reached out and said, do something. Here's your, here's your opportunity to go through regular order and actually deliver a bill so we can negotiate. Mm -hmm. We want you to do something. Please do something, and nothing happened. And, and the really tough thing is the state passed, mm -hmm. you water know, bond? the State Groundwater Management oh. Act. And, True. you know, you've only got so much time where you can get a bill passed, get projects started, start actually working on those before the State Water Groundwater Management Act goes into place, and then all of a sudden they start taking land out of production to balance the checkbook of water because we need more water. So it, it's almost like you're fighting against uh, against the clock because with the State Water Ground Groundwater Management Act and all the new rules, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's a scary situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And other things that I've worked on, sitting on the Appropriations Committee, which I'm very lucky to be on that committee. Uh, you break up the different agencies into 12 subcommittees. I sit on three, uh, Energy and Water, uh, Agriculture, and then uh, Military Construction Veterans Affairs. But even being on the committee itself, having the opportunity to do different things for different parts of the community um, is very, very good. And so uh, I've been able to put language in. And it, it's not politically the easiest thing in the world to do because you can't go out and celebrate a bill like I signed a law with your name on it. So you can't be a me, me, me type person in that position. You have to be focused on what's right for your district and putting language in those different bills that are beneficial to your district, changing the way a grant is uh, looks at different communities, which I've done for some of my communities so they can apply for grants for police stations and things like that, or uh, making sure that there was enough money in a certain agency to cover uh, whatever it may be. And so the appropriations process is something that I'm very lucky to be a part of and thrilled to be a part of, and we've gotten a lot of different pieces of language signed into law, but it's not one that you can go out and celebrate and put on your wall, because it, it became law, and it's there, but you're, it's, it just, it's buried in an appropriations bill, and, but it's good for your community. And, and so that's I, kind of a good transition, James, to the me, 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 the campaign. Right. Now you go from doing the work to how do you sell me, me, me to the constituents, our well, next part, right, we James? we will get to that right after the break. <laughs> I love it. All right, everyone, come back off the press in just a minute. 